I think there are really two fundamental paths. History is going to bifurcate along two directions. One, one, one path is we stay on Earth forever, um, and then there will be some eventual extinction event. Um, uh, the alternative is to become a space-bearing civilization and a multi-planet species, which uh, I hope you would agree that is the right way to go. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk는 50년 안에 화성에 100만 명을 이주시키겠다고 밝혔습니다. 이를 위해 타십이란 새로운 우주선도 개발하고 있습니다. 일론 머스크로 하여금 화성 진출의 연금을 불어넣은 사람 중한 명은 항공우주 엔지니어 출신인 로버트 주브린 박사입니다. 1998년 비영리 단체 마스 소사이어티를 세우고 전 세계 사람들을 향해 화성에 가는 이유와 함께 구체적인 방법을 제시해 왔습니다. 마스 소사이어티는 오늘날까지 유타주 사막 등지에 화성 기지를 본뜬 실험실을 세우고 미래 화성인을 양성하고 있습니다. 2년마다 지구와 가까 지는 화성을 가기 위한 최적의 타이밍은 2022년과 2024년 두 차례에 걸쳐 찾아옵니다. 2024년에 인류가 화성에 갈수 있을지를 주브린 박사가 날리지 스트림을 통해 공개합니다. There are really uh, three reasons uh, why we should go to Mars. They're basically uh, for the science, for the challenge, and and for the future. Okay, the as for the science, uh, the reason is this: the Mars and Earth are very different today, but the early Mars and the early Earth were twins. Uh, they were very similar. Uh, they were warm, wet planets with carbon dioxide atmospheres, and some volcanic activity. And, uh, and of course, life appeared on the early Earth. In fact, we have uh, fossils of life on Earth going back to almost as soon as the Earth was cool enough for there to be liquid water here. Um, so uh, the question is, did that happen on Mars too? Um, did, did life originate on Mars as it did on Earth? And the, um, in other words, does life evolve naturally from chemistry with high probability wherever it has acceptable conditions or, or, it, or, is, or is Earth a freak? Now, we now know that, you know, the, almost all stars have planets. We've discovered that with our Kepler Space Telescope. And 20% of the stars have Earth-like planets within what's called the habitable zone of a star, which is the right distance for uh, the temperature for liquid water. Um, so if life evolves naturally from chemistry, uh, then it should have appeared on Mars. And if, it, and if it did, then it's all over the place. It means the universe is filled with life. Um, and <clears throat> since we know the whole history of life on Earth has been one of evolution from simple forms to more complex forms with greater capacities for activity and intelligence and ever more rapid evolution, if life's everywhere, it means intelligence and civilization is everywhere. Then there's the challenge. I believe that civilizations are like individuals. We grow when we challenge ourselves and we stagnate when we do not. And uh, you know, a humans to Mars program would be a tremendous positive challenge to every country that decides to take part, in particular to the youth of the countries. You know, the United States <clears throat> are science graduates during the Apollo period of the 1960s, and in some fields tripled it um, because the Apollo program was when we committed to go to the moon. That made science the great adventure. In fact, I myself am one of those <clears throat> young people of the 1960s who went into science because of, of the space program. Now, I happen to be unusual in my generation in that I actually ended up working on the space program. But, you know, the rest of them went off and they, 
built Silicon Valley, you know? And so here, look, look at all this uh, scientists we have working on solving the COVID problem. Well, we're not going to solve it on the space station. I'm not claiming anything like that. Uh, but I am willing to bet a lot of money that uh, the teams that do find the cures for COVID uh, include a lot of biologists who became biologists because they were excited about science by the space program. Okay. And, and, and you know, the creation of a generation of scientists, engineers, inventors, doctors, the technological entrepreneurs. These are the kinds of people that advance the economy, that advance medicine, that advance national defense. You know, these are the kinds of people we need. These are the basis of the wealth and strength of a society. And there, there's no better way to create them than to challenge youth with the great adventure of exploring and pioneering Mars. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's the future, which is if, if we do what we can do in our time, which is establish that first human foothold on Mars, then you know, 300 years from now, there will be new nations on Mars, new branches of human civilization. And not just on Mars, but on thousands of planets orbiting other stars. And new nations, new languages, new literatures, new philosophies, uh, innumerable new uh, technologies and inventions made in response to new environments, uh, histories of great deeds uh, th that will be used to inspire people to go further. And, and that is something grand and wonderful. And if you have it in your power to create something grand and wonderful, um, then you should. Um, there's always been private participation, okay, uh, at least in the American space program, sure. Uh, Russian obviously is different, but the but what uh, has changed in the past, well, be beginning 20 years ago and, and very visibly in the past 10, mm -hmm. is uh, private leadership in this. In other words, previously, NASA would say, here's what the next launcher is going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, and these are the requirements. And you can build it for us, Lockheed, but we're gonna design it and we're gonna, you know, we'll pay you back for your costs and plus 5% profit or something um, and this kind of thing. So it was really very government led. But, you know, what Musk did was he said, look, you want 10 tons delivered to orbit. I'll deliver 10 tons to orbit for you. Mm -hmm. And I will do it at this price which is half of what you're paying now. But don't tell me how I have to design the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me that you're gonna pay me 5% more than what it costs me, okay? Because frankly, contracting in that way eliminates any incentive for companies to cut costs, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, just here's my cost. Don't ask me how much it costs me to make this rocket. Uh -huh. Don't come at me and say, I, I don't deserve to get $50 million because it only cost me $30 million to build the rocket. No. If you're getting this for $50 million and the other people are charging you $200 million, you should just be happy. And don't complain to me about the fact that I can build it cheaper than that. Okay? And for a while, they, they couldn't accept this. But finally, they did. And lo and behold, okay, completely changed the game. And not only that, introduced all sorts of very new kinds of systems. Uh, you know, things that if it was up to them, they never would have gone for. They would have said, well, no one's ever done this. We're not gonna do this. Um, whereas he's, you know, it's much more innovative. Uh, I mean, the private sector tends to be much more creative than, you know, government officials are in general. I mean, there's exceptions you can think of, but uh, th this is generally the rule. And, uh, and also simply because there's a lot more private companies. So you get diversity of approaches. And if some fail, well, too bad. But the ones that work, you know, come out. Um, and the, so um, this is an entrepreneurial revolution. Now, I happen to know that in China, they are trying to figure out how to duplicate this. 
Um, that is, of course, there is a very powerful government, military, industrial complex that does things its own way, but they also know that they that this kind of, of, of technology development could be very valuable to them. So in fact, there are entrepreneurial space companies have sprung up in China. Uh, and I don't know, some of them probably have some space government support. Uh, I know of one at least that has support from Alibaba. We'll see. But uh, I think that it's, it's not going to be possible to be a, a spacefaring country of the first rank if you don't promote an entrepreneurial space sector. Well, Starship Project is a great project. Uh, now, you know, the cost of space launch was enormous when we first got to orbit in 1958. Then as we got better at space technology, the cost went down to $10,000 a kilogram by 1970, the time of the moon landings. But it stayed at $10,000 a kilogram for 40 years after that until 2010. Since 2010, as a result of Musk introducing the mostly reusable Falcons that he has, the cost of space launch has dropped from 10,000 a kilogram to 2,000 a kilogram. That's a factor of five. Now, Starship is going to be fully reusable and have a larger payload capacity than the Falcons. And uh, there's a chance he'll be able to cut the cost of space launch by another factor, at least a five, maybe 10. So going down from 2,000 a kilogram to two, three, four hundred dollars a kilogram. It's an enormous benefit. Now, I visited Musk at his Boca Chica uh, facility in February um, of 2020 and uh, saw, talked with him and I saw what he was doing there. And he wasn't just building a ship, he was building a shipyard, okay? That is, he was building a facility to mass produce starships. Uh, and they are currently producing the prototypes there at a rate of one a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and the philosophy is, we're just going to fly them. And yeah, sure, the first ones are going to crash. And we'll figure out what went wrong and we'll fly the next one. Okay, he has one of his qualities, you know, it, you know, people talk about how smart he is. And he's very smart. But another quality he has is he's very tough. He can take failure and keep mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. That's a great strength mm -hmm. and the ability to, 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 to keep going when you have failed and just keep going until you mm -hmm. succeed. And the so the next starship, uh, I, I, I think number nine will probably work, but I could be wrong, it could fail, but then number 10 will work. He's already built 10, 11, and 12. Yeah. Uh, the, the, so he's ready. Um, and this is happening. Now, Musk, of course, always uh, claims he can do things faster than he can really do them. Uh, it's just his, his attitude, his mindset. He, um, he, he's got tremendous confidence, perhaps more than the situation warrants, but nevertheless, it drives him forward and um, the, he, he's, he's willing to take failure. Um, there's no one going to fire him if his rocket crashes. He says he's going to reach orbit this year. I personally think the odds are against that happening. Um, I, I mean, I give it one chance in five. Um, the, I think the chances of reaching orbit next year are about 50-50. And I think his chance of reaching orbit in 2023 is 90% uh, and 100% in 2024. Uh, the, the, so this is happening, okay? So by making the mission uh, practical, Musk is gonna make it sellable. Now there are things that you need for a Mars mission beyond the rocket. Rocket's the biggest thing you need. But there's all sorts of other things. You need Mars spacesuits. You probably need surface nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and a nuclear reactor would be a hard thing for Musk to develop because it involves controlled materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, 
I understand that South Korea has a nuclear industry. Yep. Um, perhaps it could be the company that uh, the country that develops space nuclear power. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a really important part of the mission. Mm -hmm. Power is extremely important. Uh, you know, but anyway, there's a whole bunch of systems that are needed um, um, for a Mars mission beyond the transportation. Mm -hmm. And if the government or a group of governments were to step forward and say, okay, Elon, you bring the rocket, we'll bring the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make it a public-private partnership, make it international. I think we'll be on Mars by 2030. Start a space program. Um, it will do your country a great deal of good. You do not want to say to some of the brightest young Koreans, hey, if you want to be a space explorer, go live in the United States. Mm -hmm. You don't want to say that to them. Okay. You want to say to them, look, you want to be a space explorer. You want to do anything that you can do with your technological genius. You can do it here. 